can't act independently. They're under the control of adults. In this case, by definition, they're in school. So when you hear 16-year-olds scream, hey, NRA, how many people did you kill today? You can guess about whether they know what they're saying or whether they really believe it. Some of them do. But you can be certain adults are behind it. And they are. Today's events were organized by the Women's March with the support of dozens of other groups, from Michael Bloomberg's gun lobby to Planned Parenthood. Celebrities, journalists, political elites across the country cheered them on. The TV channel Nickelodeon went dark for 17 minutes to show support for, quote, kids leading the way. In New York City, a student die-in was joined by the governor of the state, Andrew Cuomo. In Baltimore, that city spent more than 100 grand in taxpayer money to transport students to anti-gun rallies. This in a city with one of the highest murder rates in the nation, a city that cannot afford trash cans or street lights. Meanwhile, in Alexandria, Virginia, 65 students walked out of an elementary school as if kids under 10 can go anywhere by themselves. Now, whether you like the kids or like what they're saying, and you may, but you should be opposed to this because kids should not be used to advance political agendas, anyone's. Why? Because they're children. They're not old enough to have the perspective that adults do. That's why we don't let them vote or drink, or if today's protesters have their way, buy guns. And so it's wrong to exploit them, which, by the way, is exactly what is being done to them today, what the left is doing and has always done, from Mao's Red Guards to right now. The ANC in South Africa used kids as political props in the 80s. Their cause was obviously morally defensible. Causes usually are morally defensible. But in the process, an entire generation of kids learned to believe that activism is more important than learning. And a lot of them regret it now. They were exploited. And they're being exploited here. No matter what they chant, remember that the enemy of the adults behind this isn't the NRA. It's anyone who opposes their broader agenda. That's mostly people who have no power at all. So the message from our elites is really simple. Stand against us, and you're against children, and therefore you're a monster. And if you're a monster, you deserve to be destroyed. It's a kind of moral blackmail. Igor Volsky is director of Guns Down America. He joins us tonight. Igor, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So um, my complaint is not that people disagree with me on the Second Amendment. I think that's totally legitimate, and I think it's fair to have a debate on I mean, on I this. probably agree with you, actually. But well, maybe you do. Maybe yeah. you do. My first problem is the use of children to make a political point. So would you, for example, I know you supported what happened today, have a problem if these kids were being driven by their teachers in buses to, a, to an NRA rally? or if they were rallying against transgender bathrooms, the March for Biology. How would you feel about that? Well, you know what I love to see? I love to see students who are out there engaging in the democratic process, students who are doing really what teachers want them to do, what teachers teach them to do, and that is take part in critical thinking, find something they believe in, and fight for it. I mean, you saw the students well, in the no days. There's no critical thinking here. There's no but critical... you didn't answer my question, which is if they were being taken to pro-life marches or anti-gay marriage marches or something you disagreed well, with disagree by with teachers. I disagree with your premise. I don't think. No, but how would you feel? Yeah. But would you say that's totally cool? That, that's my. I mean, my question anyway, is really a hypothetical question of yes. do I think students should be taken against their will somewhere no, no, to do no, something? No, no. If I, teachers, don't, I don't care if, what it is. If teachers were abetting a march, if teachers across the country were saying to kids, let me help you get to a march that represented something that you found morally repugnant, would you be supportive on principle? Would you say this is them engaging in the democratic process? For guns, for I example. I mean, if your premise is should students be taken somewhere by teachers where they don't want to go, no. I agree My with you that shouldn't is, happen. Would you be I'm saying if you the students agree want with to it. do this, I and mean, you heard the students after the shooting, you heard what the students said, they believe this in their gut, and the reason is, Tucker, is because they've experienced these bullets, they've heard these bullets, they've buried their classmates, I'm that's not, why but, they're but doing this, nobody's forcing no, 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 them what you're to doing, engage in this, and I'm not saying, saying that, uh, kids who are under the care of a teacher who has control of their grades in life are not free agents. They can't act fully independently as you and I can because they are under the control of an authority figure. This is really simple. This is why teachers aren't allowed to have sex with students because they're in power and the kids aren't. So why are teachers allowed to direct kids toward a political ideology? It's really simple. Because the teachers are not directing students to anything. This is student-led. This is the power of this movement, of this moment, is that we're now in a situation where students are saying, enough is enough from the lawmakers who don't want to change the gun laws. Enough is enough from the NRA who wants to just push their guns everywhere agenda and for everyone agenda. We're going to push for change. That's what they're doing. That's what's really inspiring about all of this. But, I mean, if I could just make an obvious, almost technical point, which is that kids can't vote. Kids of the age of most of these students, 16-year-olds, can't vote. So they're actually 
not in the democratic process. And we've agreed that they shouldn't be in the democratic process. We've agreed that until they can make rational decisions, they can't vote. And by the way, you don't want them to buy guns. So if they're too young to buy guns, why should they be making my gun laws? But you know who wants them no, no, to buy guns? The NRA. The NRA specifically who cares about to... the NRA. Well, I'm asking because you what you think. And so why should people who don't have the right to buy guns have the right to make my gun laws? It's a simple question. What's I mean, answer? they're not they are not making your gun laws. They're the law makes the Yeah, and as citizens in this country, they're allowed they're to influence citizens. the Democrats. They're, they're not they're citizens. They're children. They're not of 18. They're Americans, Look. but they don't have the full rights of citizenship because they're not adults. They can't drink alcohol. They, a lot of them can't drive cars. You don't want them to buy guns, and they Tucker, can't vote. My, I mean, my, is there a difference between an adult and a child? I mean, of course. Okay, then why my, do you the acknowledge point, that then? Well, of course <laughs> there's a difference. My point is they've been placed in this situation where their lives are in danger in American schools. And the reason is is because of decisions, A, hold up, that lawmakers made, and B, because of the agenda of the NRA that wants to put even more guns can into their you, classrooms. Can I ask and you a I question? think it's okay for them. And Noble for them I, to say. I get it, because you like it. But if they this. were going out, if one of their teachers, some scary alt-right person, was taking him to a Milo rally, you would freak Look, out, I'm, as you I, know. And you know it. Just admit it. And let's just be honest with each other. Look, if there I, were 50,000 kids Tucker. going to a Milo Yiannopoulos rally right now, taken by their teachers from Fort Worth, you would say this but is the Tucker, end of America. The students aren't doing this because going to Milo rallies because that's not what they believe. Oh, they it's believe not they, no, they believe this. what you believe. And all hold, up, you, hold up, Tucker. You they had, believe what progressive you had, adults believe. Tucker, you had students bury their friends. I agree. You had students lose friends, you and that happens we, all across the country. The theatrics pull back. No, no, it's I'm not aware of it. It Tucker. Is. I don't it understand is. what you're just Dismissing I'm not in any way causes what by you're, saying the, the adults told them what, to do what you're doing is engaging in the classic moral blackmail techniques of the left, which is rather than make a rational case, you point to children and say, if you oppose what I believe, you're against. No, them. no, here's my rational case. So let me ask you a rational question. You have sent a number of tweets out recently saying the cops are racist; they kill a disproportionately high number of African have Americans. I? Yes, yeah. I can look. I'm not attacking you for that. I don't tweet about that. Racism plus police brutality plus guns equals Alton Sterling, Philando well, Castile, etc. Are you, are you I'm not attacking you. I'm not. I'm asking yeah, you. Yeah. It's a predicate okay. to a okay. question. Go ahead. Please, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead. If you believe that the police have a problem with racist violence, why do you want the police to be the only people to have guns? It's a simple question. Well, I don't want the police to be the only people to have guns. I want I want to move us to a country where we where we have fewer guns and where we don't have assault weapons and where we don't have assault weapons that can kill large would numbers of people. Would the cops have police? No, that doesn't mean we need. Criminal. No, hold on, wait. The, the cops that you've described as racist would they have assault weapons? Tucker, I'm no, not I'm asking a sincere question. Why are you I am arguing that racism plays a role in the disproportionate murder of young black men. And I don't That's know why you're not more, why you're so trusting of police you say are killing people I mean, out of animals. You know that's not what I'm saying. Look, I want to have a I want right, to have a serious right. conversation. Right. I'm trying to have a serious conversation. I'm you're trying, telling me I'm I mean, dismissing the children. <laughs> you are dismissing well, the children. You're laughing at the, you just I have four children. children. I'm not dismissing the children. You're dismissing me. these children. Of course I'm not. I think you are. Numerous top Democrats went out of their way to pander during today's protest. Watch. We need laws, not nice thoughts and prayers. The NRA has made me public enemy number one, and I'm proud of it. Are you going to vote out of office the people who take the gun lobby money and put your safety at risk? The NRA has held Congress hostage for years now. These young people have shown up to spring us free. We need a vote now. We need a vote now. We need a vote now. Dan Bongino is a former Secret Service agent and a contributor to NRA TV, and he joins us tonight. Hey, Dan, so what do you make of this? What do you make of this march? Well, a couple things are going on here, and your prior guest did it, Nancy Pelosi just did it, and a number of those politicians taking advantage of those kids at a rally I thought was designed to reduce targeted school violence, not to pass legislative items on the Democrat agenda. But, you know, shame on us for bringing it up, Tucker. We're the ones who are dismissing the kids, according to the left. But he did two things, your prior guest, which is interesting here. First, he did the appeal to emotion 
where they talk about emotion as if emotion is reason in this case. Of course we all feel horrible about what happened in Parkland. That the, the point stipulated. There, there's no dispute there. But what he does is he confuses the emotion surrounding the situation with reason and reasonable measures that going forward would reduce school violence. But he did something else that I found particularly disturbing, and they do it too. The liberals do this all the time. They do this utopian fallacy thing where they say things that are clearly nonsensical designed to make you look foolish. What they do is they say things like, well, we all want fewer guns in schools. Of, of course we do. But you don't get to pick that. The darn bad guy does, Tucker. Bad guy walks. You think well, the course. bad guy walks in there in the school and he goes, oh, listen, there's a sign up that says we want fewer guns in schools. Let me turn around. We don't live in utopia. We don't live in a perfect world. And it's really infuriating having a debate with people who constantly engage in these silly tactics, never want to get anything reasonable done. Yes. And they do this strictly to make you look silly. So how would you feel if your child's teacher were proselytizing about a very specific political view and then took him out of school, put him on a bus, and brought him to a political rally? Wouldn't you have a right to be outraged since that's not why you're sending him to school? Uh, I Outrage? I'd be pretty pissed, Tucker. Uh, I send my yeah. kids to school learning you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I don't expect political indoctrination. Now, I, I don't listen, if a teacher has a political opinion and it's happened to me before, I've lived in a couple liberal states, I, unlike a lot of liberals, encourage my daughters to go back to school and make their case and make it in a reasonable fashion. And you know what? If the teacher gives them a bad grade because of it, we can go fight that fight. But that's what reasonable people do. They don't encourage kids to walk out of school during the middle of the day I mean, you know what kept occurring to me today? What happened? God forbid one of these kids walking out of school was hit by a car or something like that. I don't send my kids to school to engage in a political protest. Come on. No, and you ought to pull your kids out immediately if they are exploited in the way these kids are being, in my opinion. You ought to pull them out anyway. Uh, it's a joke. Dan, thank you. Great to see you. Yes, sir. Well, the press were almost unanimous in their positive, fawning, uncritical coverage of today's walkouts. Here's the selection. I'm already choked up thinking it's kids, it's kids leading the nation begging for school safety because the adults have failed them. The power of these young people, the decisions they make, they cannot be bought, they are fearless. It's pretty incredible to see these students of all different ages, some as young as 14 to 13 years old, having a strong opinion, not wanting to be underestimated uh, about what they have to say. So we're expecting a lot of very visual, very powerful moments here in the nation capital as students across the nation step in and say enough. Joe Concha writes about media for The Hill and has to watch that crap all day long. We're hiring only dumb people in TV news, I noticed. When did that happen? Did an order go out that only totally non-skeptical low IQ people get microphones now? Is that new? Uh, well, look, uh, Tucker, reporters' jobs, and, and Stephanie Rule, for instance, was in the first two sound bites you had there, and, and she's an, an anchor. She's not a pundit. And right. It, they're, simply, they're there to simply report, and I, I go back to the movie Broadcast News, and I don't know if you remember, it's in the late 1980s, and William Hurt is this hotshot anchor, and at the end of this report where they're talking about an event where they avoided tragedy, he says, in other words, I think we're all going to be okay now, and this curmudgeon producer, station chief, back in the control room, looks up at the monitor and says, who the hell cares what you think? And that's gone completely away now, because we're, we're having... We're having anchors inject opinion and emotion. I think that about myself every instead day. Instead of letting the pictures tell the story. You know, I agree, but I, I guess what kind look, for uh, issues like this, gun control, abortion, the social issues, the press has always been completely on one side. But I've never seen entire TV networks devote their coverage basically as an in-kind contribution to the marches, which is what happened today. I mean, a line definitely has been crossed. This wasn't this way two years ago. Oh, no, this is activism in, in many quarters at this point, and it is taking a side. I, I did see uh, one, or here anyway, uh, one interview today that didn't get a lot of play, and it because it, it came from a different perspective, and it came from somebody who's a very famous person, one of the great NBA players of all time, went to a police academy after he retired and became an unofficial uh, deputy, and his name is Shaquille O'Neal, and here's what he told WABC Radio in New York. He said, quote, the government should give law enforcement more money. Give more money, you're 
recruit more people. And the guys that are not ready to go onto the streets, you put them in front of schools. You put them behind schools. You put them inside of schools. Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, goes on to argue that banning guns simply is not something that will work alone because, A, there's 300 million of them out there. And yeah, this no, is the type of solution that, that deserves many, many different ideas being brought forward. And instead, what we're seeing now is a media pushing one idea forward, which is if you ban guns, you solve the problem. And this is much more comprehensive than that, Tucker. So I saw some, I mean, if we're going to ban guns, we should start with the bodyguards at network news divisions. You know what I mean? Let's kind of spread the pain around here a little bit. It shouldn't just be widows in West Texas who have to give up their protection. It should be nightly news anchors. Um, Viacom shut down its programming entirely and went black. I've never seen a channel turn down advertising dollars. That's how strongly they felt about this. Oh, yeah, I wrote about this earlier this morning. Actually, Viacom is a media company, and they own several networks, uh, cable networks anyway, whether that be a black entertainment network uh, or uh, whether it be also Comedy Central, uh, whether it be Nickelodeon, MTV for 17 minutes at 10 a.m., 17 being the number of people that were killed, of course, in Parkland. Uh, they, they ceased all regular programming, and in Nickelodeon's case, they said, you know, we're, we're, we're shutting down uh, because the kids are leaving and, and we're here to support them. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what they said. And again, yeah. that's that's advocacy, that's activism. You could agree or disagree with it. Uh, but at the same time, this was an unprecedented event that we saw uh, via Viacom this morning. Yeah, it's also cheap moral preening. And if they really cared, they'd pay the college scholarships to everybody at, at Parkland. Uh, but I don't think they will somehow. Joe, great to see you. By the way, do you get a bodyguard? Because I don't get a bodyguard. I don't <laughs> have any course for that. No, Cable, man. Just saying. Uh, I'm not allowed to answer that. Uh, no, we're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Texas just won a big victory over sanctuary cities in the courts, and it could mean jail time for pro-sanctuary politicians. That is next up. A federal appeals court handed a victory to the state of Texas today. It upheld that state's law banning sanctuary cities and allowing the state to comply with federal law. The law threatened officials with jail if they refused to cooperate with federal immigration authorities. Meanwhile, nine immigrants have sued the administration over its decision to revoke temporary protected status for several countries. The status is supposed to provide short-term deportation relief from those who've arrived from dangerous places. Thousands have lived here for decades under that status, not temporarily. Now, those people say that removing their status would be racist. Lee Gellern is Deputy Director of the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project, and he joins us from New York. Hey, Lee, thanks for coming. Um, as I understand it, you're upset that Texas is following federal law? We are not upset that Texas is following federal law. We don't think Texas is actually following federal law. That's one of our claims. What we are concerned about is that the Trump administration is now going to have localities enforcing immigration law. These are not trained individuals. They don't always want to do it. They don't have the resources to do it. And I think one myth is that they're not doing it when there's serious criminals in their localities. They were doing it with serious criminals, but what they don't want to do is become regular immigration agents going after people whose visas have expired. But why would it be? I know we've sort of taken this off the table as a, as a culture, as a sort of cable TV world, but like if someone's here illegally, why shouldn't anybody who's here illegally be subject to deportation? Well, I don't think that's the question. I think the question well, is... Well, no, but let me, I know that's never the question, but can we just ask it really quickly? What's, is that a crazy idea? There are 11 million people here-ish, probably more, we don't really know, but who aren't allowed to be here. They've overstayed or they've snuck in. So why would it be out of hand to say, you know, that's the law. If you don't like the law, change the law. But as the law stands, you've got to leave, like now. Would that be bad? Right. I mean, we are not saying that there should be open borders, but we do think people should have an individualized determination because many of those people do have a right to stay. So, for example, there are people from Iraq who have been here a long time. Now, the Trump administration wants to remove them and says, well, you have a final order. Well, it's clear they're Chaldean Christians. It's clear they're going to be tortured if sent back. So we're just asking for more time so they can pre pre present a motion for relief so that they won't be tortured. So those are a lot of the 11 million people we're talking about. Well, no, that's that's not. I'm sorry. That's. I know you're a lawyer. I know something about this. That's not a lot of the 11 million people. They're not all Chaldean Christians. Oh, you know, no, no, I mean, I might right. support them if they were, but they're not. But yeah. I just want to get because you know you're an ACLU lawyer, the number right. two guy on the project. You're you're kind of at the center of this debate. Right. How would you feel about it if a state, Iowa, for example, Steve King State, said, you know what, it's against federal law to be here. Everybody who's here, everyone working at the hog plant who's not here legally has to leave. Would the ACLU challenge that? 
Look, we, what we would challenge is a lack of due process for people. And so if you're just picking them up and removing them without any individualized hearing, we would challenge that. But just to get back to the Texas law that you, you wanted me to talk about, I think the danger there is that localities autonomy is being usurped and so we lost in the appeals court but critically that was on the face of the statute and what the appeals court made clear is we should come back and challenge the implementation of the law if we see anything wrong and I think people ought to be on the lookout for a few things one is that Texas made a concession during the litigation that the Fifth Circuit accepted which is that if a locality can't do the cooperation because of a resource constraint then they shouldn't be forced to do it so we're concerned that the Trump administration is going to be pushing localities to do it regardless of resources. So we will be looking at whether Texas complies with that. We'll also be looking at whether local officials actually know how to well, enforce immigration. Well, okay, but, but may I just ask yeah. one quick question? Right. Again, not a lawyer, but I mean, you're in New York. Texas is its own state, no longer a public, but still a state. And if they decide that they want to do this, who are you to say that they shouldn't be allowed to? Right. Well, it's not me individually, right? We are at the ACLU. No, no, but I mean, I think that's an important point. I didn't mean me and the at the ACLU, right? I mean, we are representing police chiefs, sheriffs, mayors down there. And so let me just give you an example. One of our plaintiffs is the sheriff of Maverick County. He was Border Patrol for 25 years, then became the sheriff of Maverick County. He's not against enforcing immigration law, but what he is against is having his police force co-opted so that if it's not a dangerous criminal, he doesn't want to have to use his resources to go after a visa violator. Yeah, I know. It's hard to take that seriously, but thank you. Uh, thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. Well, a college student agreed with the vast majority of people over the vast majority of human history and stuck with the biological answer. Only two genders, he said. He was kicked out of class for that. He joins us next to tell us what happened. Well, America has experienced a rapid, in fact, a massive inflation in genders. At one point, biologists were allowed to determine what biology was, and there were two, male and female. Now there's agender, bigender, two-spirit, herja, hedra. We could go on forever, uh, literally forever, because the core orthodoxy is that there are infinite genders. But not everyone agrees. Some people believe in science at their peril, it turns out. Lake Engel is one of them. He's a student at Indiana University of Pennsylvania in a religion class, a class about Christianity. He stated his belief that there are two genders because, again, that's biology. And for that, he was told he had to apologize in front of the class, stand silently while they critiqued him for the education camp stuff. Lake Engel joins us tonight. Lake, thanks for coming up. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So I don't know if I was mischaracterizing that. You had this professor called Allison Downey, who was so threatened because you disagreed with her that she tried to get you to sign some form apologizing for your unorthodox, non-allowed thoughts. And then what happened? Right, yeah, she asked that I would sign a document complying with her, asking me to apologize to the class as well as giving her a written apology. She asked that I would stand in front of the class in silence um, as I apologized, and then they would give any comments on my outbursts. Did she say what specifically she was so offended by? Uh, she didn't like the fact that I disagreed with the subject being pushed in class, being more than one gender, male privilege, uh, systemic sexism, and uh, mansplaining. What's, is mansplaining a, a, a measurable thing? I mean, is it a like, species of social science studying mansplaining? What is mansplaining anyway? Do you know? Did you learn? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's any time a, a man speaks, really. Huh. And so no, it you, isn't measurable. What did you, right, I mean, it's a... It's a species of dumbness, really. So, but what did you, it's propaganda, what did you say about gender that made her so mad, specifically? Well, I first referenced uh, entities like The Economist who have debunked the myth of the 77 cents on the dollar wage gap. And I also stated that biologists don't agree that there are more than two genders. Um, they don't believe that there are 72 genders or more across the board. M most of them disagree. And she really didn't appreciate that. So by citing the long-standing view of biologists, the hard scientists, Allison Downey, who supposedly, you say she's a professor, tried to get you to stand in front of the class and take abuse. Did you do that? 
No, I didn't. I, I was supposed to, but she really didn't give me a chance. I was given 10 days to comply, uh, but the day after she asked this of me, she decided to push it on through to the university's provost office to then hold a hearing, which would decide whether or not it could be allowed in class, period. Why do you go to this school? Or why does anybody go to this school or any other school? I mean, what are you getting out of this exactly? Well, I initially went for athletics my freshman year, but that's a long gone dream now. Um, I'm pretty much just stuck here. Man, I wish I could hire you. I would encourage you and anyone else who has any experience like this to drop out and join the workforce. It's not worth it. This is a joke. It's a bubble, and we're all going to realize that in 10 years. Like, you're a brave man for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Tucker. Well, Elizabeth Warren is considering, continuing to assert and flaunt her Native identity. She was at a Native American event recently, but a Cherokee genealogist looked into it and says the whole thing is pure nonsense. It's kind of offensive, actually. She joins us next with her findings. Stay tuned. Live pictures for you. You're looking at right there. Andrews Air Force Base, right outside Washington D.C. That's the airport that the president uses, uh, maintained by the Air Force. He's just landed back from California, where he was, among other things, taking a look at prototypes of a border wall. But he's back in town. Well, Senator Elizabeth Warren continues to insist that she is a genuine American Indian, is in spirit, if not genetically. And to support her claim, she cites her parents whom she claims had to elope due to racist objections to her mother's part Indian heritage. Trial Barnes is a, an actual Cherokee genealogist. She's looked into this, and she joins us tonight to tell us what she's found. Trial, thanks for coming up. Thank you. So if you could just settle this for us, since this is something that you're expert in, is Elizabeth Warren a Cherokee Indian? No. No. She doesn't have... Um, she, she's not enrolled. She has no family on the rolls. She has no indication of Indian ancestry anywhere in her lineage. Hmm. And yet she represented herself as one for years and was promoted uh, on the basis of her claim that she was an American Indian. She also has this story, which she just repeated the other day, about her parents being subject to the racism of the time because one of them was part Native American. What do you know about that? Is that true? I don't believe it's true. They um, were married by a prominent minister in a town just, you know, maybe 15 miles away. Um, he was prominent enough that he wrote the, the, I mean, he basically put the, that religion in Oklahoma and okay. helped found a college there in that religion. I don't think he would have done a wedding for two kids that ran away and eloped and their parents didn't approve. Also, um, Elizabeth Warren's father, his, he had at least one brother and one sister who also just went and had small weddings the same way. I just think it's the way their family did things at the time. I don't think it was an elopement. Yeah, though she's claimed that for years and held herself up as the victim of American racism conveniently. Uh, as a but nobody's looked into this really until you did. There are a lot of American Indians in Oklahoma. What do they think of these claims? Well, I can't speak for all of them. I could speak for the ones that I talked to, and you know, some just laugh because it's so yeah. ludicrous. I mean, you know, she has no proof of anything. She's a lawyer, and she's supposed to understand. You know, you need proof. Yet she keeps claiming. Um, many are angry because they feel like she, you know, she's appropriating an identity to gain something from that. Yeah. And she has no respect for true Native Americans. I think all of that's true. It's identity theft. There's no doubt. Twyla, thank you for settling that for us. I think pretty much for all time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, changes in the American economy have devastated working age men, and the numbers are more surprising than you may guess. Part two of our Men in America series is next. Well, they're invisible in Washington, uncounted by the official unemployment numbers you hear on television, and yet they're everywhere. Americans who have dropped out of the workforce, workers who don't work. An ever-increasing percentage of these are male. 
about 7 million American men between the ages of 25 and 54 no longer have jobs. That's more than 10% of the entire prime age male labor force in the United States. It's a huge number. Most of those men, studies predict, will never return to work. What happened? Well, some of the causes are well known. Competition from foreign manufacturers crushed our country's industrial sector. China's entry into the WTO alone destroyed more than 2 million American jobs. Automation is killing many more. A disproportionate number of these jobs are in traditionally male industries, manufacturing, agriculture, logging. A 2016 McKinsey report found that, quote, 90% of what welders, cutters, solderers, and brazers do could be replaced by robots, and soon. Jobs in which women are the majority tend to be far less vulnerable to automation. Three of the five fastest growing professions are dominated by women. The jobs that remain for men tend to pay less than the ones that disappeared. This is especially true for working class men who, unlike their female counterparts, have seen, seen their real wages fall over time. Now, part of the reason for that is mass immigration. More than a million new immigrants enter this country every year legally. A large but unknown number come illegally. Most of these are low-skilled. All of them are looking for work. These new rivals compete primarily with the very Americans most likely to have lost their jobs. And the effect is lower wages. It's a matter of supply and demand. An overabundance of anything makes it cheaper, and that goes for labor. One study conducted after the Mariel boat lift in Florida found that Americans with lower education levels in Miami, the most vulnerable, saw their wages fall by 37% after the immigrants arrived. Policymakers didn't seem to notice, and they still don't, probably because it doesn't affect them. If waves of immigrants from the third world are becoming lawyers and nonprofit executives and members of Congress, how long would the border stay open? Meanwhile, millions of American men now make less than their fathers did. That's a tragedy. It's a betrayal of the American dream. But it's also a recipe for societal collapse. When men's wages decline, families fall apart. This fact is well known to researchers. It's been the subject of many studies over decades with consistent results. And yet it's rarely noted in public. Here's some of what we know. One well-regarded study released last year found that when men's wages fell relative to women's, families didn't form. According to the authors, a falling male wage reduced, quote, the attractiveness of men as potential spouses, thus reducing fertility and especially marriage rates. Researchers also noted a dramatic increase in out-of-wedlock births when men made less. In the words of one of the authors, an economics professor at MIT, quote, we see a decline in fertility, a decline in marriage, but a rise in the fraction of births that are disadvantaged. As a consequence, the kids are living in pretty tough circumstances. Numerous academic studies have reached the very same conclusion. Research from 2015 found that, quote, when a randomly chosen woman becomes more likely to earn more than a randomly chosen man, marriage rates decline. Those who do marry report being less satisfied and are more likely to divorce. Low male wages are a driving force in family dissolution, and that's why affluent neighborhoods in which men make more have a higher proportion of married couples and fewer divorces. The opposite is also true, and that leads to a cascade of social problems, which over time become a disaster. Men who make lower wages marry less and father more children out of wedlock. These children growing up without fathers tend to make lower wages themselves in later life. For decades, this was a universally recognized pattern in inner cities, the cycle of poverty. Much was written about it. Now the same destructive vortex is common in rural America. The cause isn't culture. That's what we thought. No, in both cases, the cause is the same, a lack of well-paying jobs for men. What's striking is how little notice these facts get from our policymakers. Their overriding aim is to raise women's wages to parity or above men's. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but these are complex questions with numerous and profound unintended consequences, so they deserve a vigorous public debate. It's notable that most women, the very population on whose behalf these policies are supposedly devised, strongly prefer to marry men who make more than they do. But what's beyond debate is that Washington and corporate America aren't thinking a lot about how to solve the male wage crisis. If anything, they're exacerbating it. Lawmakers in both parties, for example, have heartily embraced self-driving vehicles and drone delivery of packages. It's all impressive technology, but what would be the effect on employment? Has anyone asked that? 
There are more than 3 million professional truck drivers in this country. It is the most common job in the majority of American states. More than 90% of drivers are men. Thanks to technology, many of these men are about to lose their jobs. It's a lot of unemployed Americans. That's a lot of broken families. Washington is not worried at all about this. Lawmakers and business leaders assure us that those truck drivers will be just fine. They'll find something else to do, something better, in fact, with higher pay. And maybe they will. But keep in mind, our leader said the very same thing about manufacturing jobs 30 years ago. David Paul Kuhn is a political analyst. He's the author of What Makes It Worthy. He's done a lot of research on this subject, and we're happy to have him tonight. David, thanks for coming on. Uh, this is, it's, it's clear that there is a male employment and wage crisis, and it's clear that that is driving family dissolution in the middle of the country, which is why we're seeing the same social pathologies in rural America that we once associated with cities. It's about wages. It's pretty clear from the data. Why aren't our policymakers responding to this? I mean, I think, first of all, we have to agree that it's a crisis. Imagine 90 Lambeau fields, 90 stadiums full of men missing in action from our workforce, and we'll have a concept of the problem. And so obviously this has a, uh, a terrible effect on men. Men are far more likely to want to work, and therefore they're far more likely to be depressed when things aren't working out. And if we can at least agree on those basic facts, which we know from myriad studies, uh, I think it's a good starting place. But there seems to be resistance on the part of policymakers even to acknowledging the problem as if, and this is just a guess, it is somehow an attack on women to acknowledge that there is a male employment crisis. Politics seem to play a role. They definitely plays a role, and, our, and so does our culture. And of course, that's silly, as you would note. Obviously, you can care about women and you can care about men. It's not either or. And feminism taught sure. us that what hurts one sex hurts us all. That applies to women, but it certainly also applies to men. So yes. there's a particular working, especially blue-collar crisis among men. And if we can at least for perhaps take some of the gender politics, ironically, out of a discussion about what's happening to men, perhaps right. we can start to treat them as people. But why have we gone, I mean, the conversation appears to have moved from what you just said, an acknowledgement that the sexes are interrelated, dependent on each other, thrive only when each is thriving, to a kind of zero-sum understanding where my loss is your gain and vice versa. When did that change? I mean, you could argue it probably changed with second wave feminism in the 1970s, but it's a long, that's a long time ago. It's a half century ago nearly. And I would just say, obviously, it, it is true that it's still politically incorrect to talk about the crisis among men. If you read, unfortunately, if you read a lot of liberal publications, they'll put the word crisis in quotes as if it's not real. Can you imagine? Yeah. If we apply that to other groups that were experiencing unique downsides of our economy. So we have a crisis, and I think that if we can get past again, I, it, the hardest part is going to be past the politics and just I acknowledging think right. that it's affecting families and men and that, it cause, and that it increases the rates of depression in these men, divorce, they go to church less, they certainly remove themselves from society, and it, it's just a downward cycle and it increases the chances of drug use. and. They watch more television. It's just a, a dire situation that we have to take very seriously. Well, and in general, there's a reluctance to have serious conversations about economic questions from either side. I'm not espousing a position. I'm just saying they're never debated anymore in favor of this frivolous symbolic stuff. But quickly, there is technology right on the horizon that will displace millions of American workers, disproportionately men, self-driving cars, drones. I never hear the implications of that for employment mentioned by anybody. Why is that? Because it's treated like a, national, a natural disaster. And it's been treated like a natural disaster for decades, and it's infuriating. Because, of course, automization, deindustrialization, were major factors in this blue-collar crisis, and this blue-collar male crisis particularly. But man-made decisions impacted this crisis, yes. and they still do. And so as we move forward with autom automation, we have to consider, unfortunately, I don't think our elites do, the downside of the supposed good it will bring. That is exactly right. I mean, they treat market capitalism like a religion rather than a, a useful economic system, which it is. But we can't do anything. It's inexorable. That's right. right. Like a natural it's unfortunately disaster. true on both sides. It is true on both sides. David, thank you. That was really wise. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we have an addition to our Men in America series this Friday. Mike Rowe will continue tonight's conversation about the crisis of work and wages among American men this Friday. And, of course, the series continues next Friday at 8 p.m. Don't miss it. More ahead. Tonight's show. Stay tuned.
exercise guru Richard Simmons, who I can attest personally is actually a very nice guy, is being forced to pay almost $130,000 to the National Enquirer and Radar Online after they claimed he was planning to transition into a woman. The claims were a lie, so slam dunk case, right? No. Simmons' case was thrown out. L.A. Superior Court Judge Gregory Kiosian ruled that there is nothing defamatory about being identified as transgender, even if it's a lie. In fact, the basic idea was absurd, Kiosian said, and that means Simmons has to pay the inquirer's legal bills, but Simmons should take her. In a few years, it will likely be defamation to say somebody isn't transgender. That's where we're going, so he may get it back on the back end. That's about it for us tonight. Tune in every night, 8 o'clock, to the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. Also a show that is resolutely defending dogs, and some of them are dying on airplanes. We're going to tell you more about that tomorrow. But in the meantime, good night from Washington. Sean Hannity's next. Anyone that defends dogs is on my good list.